argument. And Mr. Darden, are you prepared to uh, continue on with your argument, sir? Yes, I am, Your Honor. Thank you. Right. Good morning, sir. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope everybody... Uh... Would you just briefly show that to counsel? <laughs> if you can. I hope everybody right. had a Thank good you. sleep last night. It was a long day yesterday. And uh, I thank you. Let me thank you in advance for hearing me again this morning. I don't expect to take up the entire morning. Uh, in fact, uh, with any luck, I won't take up more than half of it. But we'll have to see. Well, you recall where we left off yesterday. I was telling you about this defendant's relationship, this man's relationship with Nicole Brown. And I, and I told you that it was a simmering relationship. You know, it was, it was a slow burn. It was a slow burn. And I described for you and discussed with you some of the testimony that you heard in this case, testimony you heard from witnesses about their relationship. And we talked about the 1985 incident with involving the baseball bat and the Mercedes Benz. We talked about the, the, uh, the 1989 incident and the fact that the police had been there eight times before. Both the defendant here and Nicole Brown both, both admitted that. So it, I guess it's true, right? We talked about the incident uh, at the Red Onion when the defendant grabbed Nicole by the crotch and, uh, and uh, in, in front of a bar full of strangers and humiliated her. We talked about that. Uh, we talked about his admission to ship, about his jealousy after the 1989 incident. We never talked about the testimony we heard from Denise Brown. Do you remember the testimony from Denise Brown when she talked about some of the the, the really, really nasty things he would say to, uh, to Nicole. As you may recall, Denise, Denise Brown, Nicole's sister, testified that during the time that she was pregnant, the defendant would call her names. You, you, do you recall that testimony? He'd call her a fat pig. And he would call her a fat pig in front of other people. Uh, I don't know what, what you, should, uh, you should extract from that. I mean, have you ever heard of such a thing? I don't know. I would suggest, however, that that is some indication of how he really felt about her. You know, sometimes you get in a relationship, people get in a relationship, you know, and you, and you have one, one half of the relationship who's dominant, and you have another half who's somewhat passive. And the dominant half dominates the, the, the other half. And what, what effect do you suppose this would have on Nicole? That is, being called a fat pig by her husband while she's pregnant. What effect would that have on her self-esteem? Because you're probably wondering, well, hey, if he did all of these things to her, if he said all of these things to her, why did she stay? Well, there's this old song, and the words used to go that, that uh, I don't know, I think it was the dramatics, I, I can't really recall. But there was a couple of lines in the song where they said, the strong give up and move on, and the weak give up and stay. You know, if you badger a person long enough, if you beat them down long enough, if you wear them down long enough, pretty soon you strip them of their dignity, their self-esteem, and they are weak, and they are submissive, and they can't go. They can't stay. And you know how that is. Everybody knows how that is. We've all been in bad relationships before. You have friends. You see them in these bad relationships. Why? Why do they stay? Why do they stay? Usually they feel they don't have a choice. They don't know that they have a choice. They forgot that they had a choice. In their minds, they have no choice. She's a fat pig. But we talked about that yesterday, and we talked about justice, and we talked about what the real issue in this case was about, and I pointed the defendant out to you, and I told you he killed her, and you've heard the evidence in this case. He killed Ron Goldman. O.J. Simpson's a murderer. That's what the evidence indicates. 
That is what the evidence indicates. That is what the evidence shows. It shows that he's not just a murderer, but he's a double murderer. And that's unfortunate. It's unfortunate that I have to stand here and tell you this because I'd rather be somewhere else. I'm sure you'd rather be somewhere else. Who wants to really have to confront and deal with these issues? But we have to because we have a duty. Marsha and I have a duty and you have a duty as well. Your duty is to look at all the evidence, to be fair, be conscientious, be objective. And your duty is to look at all the evidence, the totality of circumstances, everything. We don't want you to just look at one piece. Don't just look at the prosecution's case. Look at the entire case. Look at everything. Because when you do, when you do, okay, what can you say except he did it? And we've proven it. And we've proven it beyond a reasonable doubt. And we talked about the safe deposit box yesterday. And we talked about the fact that Nicole knew that she was going to die. And we know that she knew that because she told the police that in 1989. And we know that she knew that because of what she saved for us, the road map she left for you in that safe deposit box the letters, the photographs, the will. You recall that testimony. And as we went through the progression here, through the history of, of, of his abuse of Nicole, and by the way, not every incident here on this chart is an incident necessarily of abuse. But we wanted to, to lay out the history of their relationship as well. And so that's why you see things like divorce and, and et cetera. So we're not trying to mislead you. But we, we thought it was important that you know how the, how the relationship developed over the years. And this is an unusual relationship. You, you have to agree. There's something wrong here. Henry Lee said there was something wrong. There's something very wrong here. This is a slow-burning, simmering relationship. And it's just like I told you yesterday, the fuse is burning. The fuse is burning, folks, and it's getting shorter, and it's getting shorter. And it's just getting shorter. But this morning, you know, I want to take things a step further, if I may, if you allow me to. Let's just cut right to the chase. Imagine a defendant in his Bronco. He is full of anger and he is full of rage and it's nighttime. And he's driving that Bronco. And he is full of jealousy. And the fuse continues to burn. And the focus of his anger is Nicole. For some reason, in his mind, she has done something that he can't ignore. Something that has set him off. He's jealous. He's raging. He's raging. He's out of control. And he's in that Bronco. And he is driving as fast as he can toward Nicole's house. And it's about 10 o'clock. He is out of control, folks. He is completely out of control. And when, and when he gets to Nicole's place, he quickly parks the Bronco and he gets out. It's 10 o'clock. He's in his Bronco. He's at Nicole's house. It's nighttime, but we're not even talking about June 12. We're not talking about June 12, 1994. We're talking about October 25, 1993. All along, I've asked you to be open-minded, to be open-minded about this man and who he is. And we have suggested to you, and I think we've proven to you, that he is not the person that you see on those TV commercials and, 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 and at halftime in those football games. That is his public persona. We all have one. We all have one. We behave a certain way when we're in public, and we behave another way when we're at home. You know what, you know what they say, nobody knows what goes on behind closed doors. And, and the fact that you may, we may see you and you may see us doesn't really mean that you know us. Or that you know me, or you know Miss Clark, or Mr. Cochran. You see us here in public. But what are we? What are we really? What are we really inside? What are we really at home? Well, we have a very, very, very nice example. Well, 
Nice is a bad choice of words. We have a very, very poor example of who this man is, of who he is at home, of who he is in his private life. It's the, it's the private side, the other side of him. And I want you to listen to a tape, a tape of an emergency call. And you recall that I played that tape for you a long time ago, months ago, and you probably forgot about it up until yesterday, I hope. But I'm going to ask you to listen to that tape in, in just a moment. Now, you know, some people say, well, how could, how could O.J. Simpson actually kill this woman and Ron Goldman when, when her kids are in the house? You know, you know what I mean? They say, well, who would do something like that? Well, he would. Keep this in mind, if you will, if, if you think it's important. In 1989, when he beat her, you'll recall that when the police came and wanted to take her to Parker Center to have photographs of her injuries taken, you'll remember that she said, I don't want to go, I just want my kids, I just, just take me back home, take me back home to my kids, my kids are at home, I want to be with my kids. The night he beat her, his kids were in the house. And when you listen to this tape from October 25, 1993, after the first couple of minutes, you hear the defendant in the background yelling and screaming and raging. You hear that rage. And you hear Nicole on the telephone say, the kids are upstairs. The fact that the kids are in the house means nothing to this man.
back on when he gets back in. For sure. Do you think he's going to get you? I don't know. I just, okay. Stay on the line. Don't hang up, okay? Keep it up. Okay. 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 Can they hear him yelling? I don't know. 